¿Qué tal amigos? Bienvenidos aquí David Adrián en el podcast Women in Music. Y sí, le cambié el nombre al podcast justamente a partir de este episodio. Más adelante van a, van a escuchar por qué. Es en esencia la misma idea, pero ahora está 100% enfocado a mujeres en la música. Y bueno, el día de hoy le toca el turno a Neely Brush, una excelente guitarrista que toca con Danny Elfman, con Dead Clock. Ha tocado con The Iron Maidens. Tiene su música solista donde hay participaciones con Andy Timmons, Steve Vai, Guthrie Govan. Es impresionante realmente el currículum de esta mujer, así que no se pueden perder este episodio, así seas guitarrista, seas baterista, cualquier tipo de música o entusiasta de la música, la verdad es que se la van a pasar bastante bien como yo me la pasé haciéndolo, y así sin más, pues vámonos al episodio. Hello Neely, how are you? Good David, thanks for having me, how are you? I'm fine, thanks, so let's get straight right to it, because there's a lot I want to talk about. Okay. So let's start from the beginning for all the people who really doesn't know you, who you are, what you do. Give me the your backstory, your two-minute summary of who you are, what you do, ending the story where you say, I want to be a guitar player for the rest of my life. How do you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, so I'm a guitar player. Uh, I play different kinds of music with uh, different artists and different people, uh, my own music as well. Uh, I'm uh, originally from Israel and thanks to the influence of my family and my older brother Ethan, I got into music and guitar and guitar oriented music very early on in my life uh, really inspired me and um, I started my, my journey with that as a, as a kid and eventually went to Berklee College of Music in Boston where my family moved to actually. Uh, and uh, from there, I went on to work with, like I said, different artists, moved over to the West Coast and ended up in Las Vegas, where I built my home. So, and yes, I would love to play guitar for the rest of my life. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you have a point in history where you say, this is the moment where I say, I want to be a guitar player for the rest of my life. Yeah, I think that happened in probably around in high, high school. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So I want to go back. You mentioned you went to Berkeley. Mm -hmm. You graduated there. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of discussion about this high end schools. Let's go mm -hmm. like that. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a waste of time. It's a waste of money. It's not worth it, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I leave mm -hmm. this thing on my own, this judgment. Mm -hmm. I went to MI uh, and okay. LA. And a lot of people ask me that, like, dude, this is a lot of money. Is this worth it? What do you get from that? Did you get a job? Did you get to play with the greatest right. artists in the world? <laughs> and so on and so on. Because a lot right. of people think that's what school will do for you. So right. what was your experience in Berkeley regarding this mm. topic? So, I mean, I had a positive experience, I have to say. Um, however, you know, we are now talking about Uh, I started almost 20 years ago. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah, I started in 2006, right? So the world was a little bit different then. Mm. Um, it was still an expensive school, obviously, always has been, but it was nowhere near where it is today. And, you know, as a 17 year old kid, I definitely, I, I knew the reality of like college being expensive, but I also grew up in the environment where everybody goes to a brand name school and just doing that for music was already kind of weird. So, yeah. um, so if anything, it was like the validation of this is okay, as long as you're going to go and get a degree kind of thing, you know, mm. um, that's, I guess their justification for, for being so expensive, right? I mean, college, I think to a degree in, in the U S is kind of an expensive piece of paper, regardless of what you're studying. Um, I, You know, if I was older, I probably wouldn't have advised myself to, to do that kind of thing. I think I was just like a wide eyed 17 year old who wanted to do it, regardless of realizing that it's really kind of a big, <laughs> big investment. Um, but I still was I, I knew that you could get the information elsewhere. I knew that you could study with the same teachers outside of Berkeley. You could spend a similar amount of money or maybe less, you know, still getting all the information that you're getting. But I went to school to, to meet my peers. You know, I wanted to have the community and, and make connections and make friends. And I, like I said, I was aware that that was my goal. And so I do feel like 
like I said, I had a positive experience. I met a lot of the people that I play with now um, and work with now, either then or they ended up being people who went to Berkeley. But, you know, like I said, my personal opinion now as an adult is, is different than, than it was then. And so I, I don't know. I mean, I think it just depends on what your end goal is and, and whether you think that's the right investment of, of that money, because, you know, it's like, you could think about it like you're yourself starting a business as a musician. It's like you could take that capital and put it into schooling or something else. You know what I mean? Right. Like there's all kinds of ways to to think about it. But um, if that's the right investment, that might be the right investment, too. So for me, it worked out. But um, it is just a school. You know, I, right. I, I do think that now as well, too. You know, it's like at the time, it's such a fishbowl environment and it's your whole life and you think that that's the goal but at the end of the day like you're not going to be a college student for the rest of your life like you're there to to learn to do something so um the real work is what it's about right yeah i think the problem is um, a lot of people think that school is going to make my career for me that's why i'm paying that's a lot of not money going to happen yeah no. i mean it's <laughs> like I, I i that's i mean and i think that's in any industry now too because unless you're you know, if you think about a bachelor's degree, like what industry, how many industries can you work in a, uh, with with a bachelor degree in like as a really good, stable job that you don't have to like be a super go getter to try and fight to get? You know what I mean? Like it's kind right. of like everywhere. Like you still have to be the person that goes out and makes something happen. Exactly. Yeah. Perfect. So I want to I go to your solo work. I want to talk mm. about your solo work because this past two weeks now. I've been listening to your oh, the, whole, awesome. the whole catalog. Oh, and awesome. Thank you. So I have this notion, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you went mm. from like sort of rock, progressive rock, Steve by the Van Halen influences, then going to, and I want to read this because I don't want to get it wrong. You went to then to a super groovy phase. I love primal, primal, mm. primal feels. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right? Thank primal, you. yeah. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I like that. So, and then you go to the Middle Eastern kind mm -hmm. of phase, and then right. you go to the mo to more pop ish mm -hmm. kind of music, which I also love. Let me tell you, love lavender. Yeah. No, thank you, lavender mountains. That's yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Thank you. So, I know you're doing right now a new album. We can mm -hmm. what we can expect from this. I mean. By listening to the whole catalog, I can assume that probably is not going to be anything like we heard before. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's exactly what I was going to say. <laughs> and there's a lot of that. Yeah, just like the rest of it, it's going to be something different. Um, but just like the rest of it, it's going to have some sort of running themes that hopefully connect it all together, uh, even if the only thing it's got in common is me. But it's usually got a little bit more in common than just me having written it. So, um, you know, I think it's still going to have a lot of the uh, straight ahead guitar stuff that I think my fans want to hear. But it's got a lot of different genres on it as well. And lots of melody, as always. And me exploring sonic <laughs> areas. Yeah. It, it, it's got a lot of um, like retro 80s -y pop stuff in it. Yeah. And I'm... Nice. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I love, you know, like, and that's something that a lot of people are doing right now, you know, like, I love that there's a resurgence of all those old synth sounds, you know. Um, so I'm kind of really just looking for the right personnel to bring that to life in an authentic way. And I think, you know, with my previous albums, it's kind of like it's a, it ends up being a similar challenge where it's just like, who's who are the right people? Because... I can't always take it the rest of the way. I don't play keys. I don't play drums, you know, mm -hmm. but I have, I have a, an idea, a vision in my head. And I, okay. you, you want to get from point A to point B in a way that doesn't completely get off course. Right. So, um, but that's such a fun challenge, you know, and, and uh, I'm, I'm really pretty excited about this music. So yeah, cool. We will wait for it. Thank so, you. <laughs> the, the, this next question is really important for me because as someone who made music for a living, I made a lot of music for TV, film, and etc. Yeah. And I made a lot of the style because really you are yeah. someone sends you references or bris or whatever, and exactly. then you get to do everything. So right. I have a lot of personal tools that I do for composing to make music mm -hmm. happen and happen 
really fast. So yeah. this question is for you, like, what is your process? I know it's way different, but I, I always curious because mm -hmm. this is the one area that I always try to build up for me, like, oh, yeah. I never, I never yeah. thought of that or, or yeah. that way yeah. of composing. So yeah. what is your process to make music? Mm. I'd like to pick your brain about that sometime too. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I've always, yeah. Um, you know, for me, uh, I've written things in different ways over the years, but the process as far as like getting the stuff done, uh, regardless of how I written it, is usually me demoing out a full picture to the best of my ability and then sending it to the rhythm section players to interpret as they are the ones who play those instruments. Um, sometimes the demos are meant to be played verbatim. Sometimes I think, hey, you know, in this section, I'm not quite feeling the groove that I came up with, but I'm not hearing anything else. Can you do your thing and bring that to, you know, like it, it's a collaborative effort. And then once you build the picture back together, then a lot of times, you know, of course, the, the melodies and the ideas are there, but uh, it definitely gets you rethinking and re interpreting your own writing basically you know once you have a, a different bed under it right yeah yeah, yeah. Um, i got it you know but yeah but that time you already have like the whole structure i think yeah yeah right. like the demos are fleshed out you know okay. they're, they're they're complete uh demos but and... get, guide me through the zero phase like i pick up a guitar okay. I, i guess you yes. you start from a guitar i pick up a guitar okay <laughs> So well, so it's actually not. Uh, so I, it's not always like that. Most of the time, it's actually me singing voice memos okay. into my phone, um, and that's my preferred way of of doing it. You know, it's like if I'm lucky, I heard it in my head. If I'm lucky, I heard more than the melody in my head. I heard some arrangement notes and some ideas, and obviously s some suggested harmony, at least at the very least. Uh, and I jot down all those notes through the voice memos as much as I can, you know, so if I'm hearing any arrangement notes, I, you know, I, th I say like, oh, uh, put a harmony on the second phrase, or there's going to be a hit here. It's like just jotting down as much information as, okay. as I hear in that moment, just to not forget it. And then the next thing is, is going to, I work with logic, um, just as a, that's, that's my dog of choice, but it's, then it's just a matter of like sitting down and, and sketching all that out. Um, okay usually doesn't start with a guitar and okay. like i said I, I i actually kind of prefer it that way because because then it means that it's singable you know what i mean and oh, so okay. you got you got something there if you if you can sing it into your phone then you know what you're trying to say like and it's right playable yeah if you go to the guitar um, you're probably gonna end it up like it <laughs> exactly exactly yeah and so and yeah. you know i don't i don't play keys like at all i have zero piano skills and i think i prefer it that way for the writing because then you know with a, with an instrument that's so simply laid out and everything right. makes sense if your technique is this you're not gonna overplay <laughs> like you're you're gonna you're gonna jot down the idea the way yeah. that it was you're not yeah. gonna bastardize anything right. yeah <laughs> So, 100% agree. It happens a lot. Yeah, it totally <laughs> does. And I mean, with guitar players, it happens the most because we don't have to breathe when we play our instrument. We can have the worst phrasing without any breaths in there because we won't pass out. So <laughs> naturally, we kind of have to learn a sense of phrasing. And so I think thinking like a singer, thinking like somebody who has to take that pause physically mm -hmm. Yep. is is why they naturally have a sense of like punctuating their music mm -hmm. yeah the phrasing um, is more natural yeah. yeah i mean singers are great songwriters for a lot of those reasons you know it's like mm -hmm. that's their i hate this word but for lack of a better word content that's that's their stuff like that's what they work mm -hmm. with all day long you know if they if they worked with guitar solos all day long that would be the thing that they're really good at <laughs> so yeah you know. okay got it perfect So let's jump uh, to Danny Elfman. How did you mm. get that that gig? So that was a, a super super random thing, and actually does kind of go back to to Berkeley. So a, a composer who went to school with uh, my my brother actually uh, named Michael Hurwitz. Uh, he told uh, Danny's studio manager about me, uh, Melissa McGregor, and she they were like you know looking to put a band together for Coachella 2020. <laughs> Okay. at the time which 
didn't uh, ended yeah, up being it didn't happen. <laughs> it didn't happen. But uh, but luckily for me, was being planned at that time because uh, had it been canceled earlier, that band wouldn't have come together. You know, I was oh, one okay. of the last people hired for that. I had a I had a rehearsal and a half with them before everything shut down and so i kind of just like squeaked by and if i had not <laughs> met danny when i did things you know it just wouldn't have yeah wouldn't have right happened. right um but yeah so um through that recommendation they they got to me they were uh concerned about my not living in los angeles <laughs> because i'm in vegas which is not okay. that far right but mm -hmm. i i told them like don't worry about it I'm four hours away. Just tell me when I need to be there. I, you know, I'll be there. And I, yeah. I went and auditioned and, and, uh, I, they didn't give me a lot of time to learn the stuff. It's just fine. You know, just a couple tunes or whatever. And, but, but Danny was like surprised that I, that I came and did that. And he told me at the end, he's like, man, like you learned that really fast. Like when, when you told us you live in Vegas, like I didn't think you were going to show up. <laughs> And I was just like, oh my God, who would stand you up? I would never. Yeah. And so, you know, that that band is is really special. And we had kind of a part two of the audition where the whole band got together and, and made sure that we like each other and, right. and get along and, and everything. And, and it was just kind of like the rest is history type of type of stories. It's been nothing but family to us from that first moment. Oh, cool. We're making that album during the pandemic and getting to know each other really well through that. And then finally bringing that to the stage. And, and now it's like a different thing, you know? Right, right, right. Only a few Which, years later. I, I just find out like two days ago that you're coming to my town. Yes. And I think in October. Or, oh, you're or talking about uh, the nightmare thing? Yeah, I'm it, not it, it only says Danny Elfman. I don't know. Yeah, either. that's that's a different. So that's the Nightmare Before oh. Christmas show, I believe. Or that's that's not without us. But actually, oh. <laughs> I I uh, Death Clock is going to Mexico City. I know it's not Monterey. Oh, okay, okay, but, yeah. yeah. Uh, that thought that's what you were referring to. But uh, I got really, 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 really lucky that I didn't have to do that show actually because hmm. Death Clock is on a on one of those cruises. And All right. we, we finished that morning. So I thought I was going to have to like make it right. across the country somehow <laughs> that day. And like, we were like seriously starting to look into like getting off that boat early mm. via helicopter. Right, 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 right. Right. I was like, is this going to, you know, teleporting so, or something? <laughs> seriously, I was very stressed out uh, and then narrowly escaped another scheduling <laughs> conflict. So I'm very yeah. sorry I won't be there. But, like it just means that I didn't miss any shows and I still get to do everything else. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's a bummer. But, yeah, I'm sorry. But, nah, no problem. We'll be next time. Yeah. So, una pausa rápida para que me dejes en comentarios a quién más quieres ver por aquí en estos episodios. Recuerda que está enfocado 100% a mujeres, así que deja tu sugerencia en los comentarios y por supuesto suscríbete porque eso ayuda bastante a seguir trayendo todos estos videos completamente gratis. Y seguimos adelante. So you talk about that clock and yeah. one of the questions, uh, what is the, what's the difference, if any, playing like someone like Danny Elfman and that clock, aside the obvious? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a different show. I think at the end of the day, you know, like I, I, I end up thinking about it in terms of the material for that particular show versus that particular show and rather than in terms of genre or technique or, you know, whatever. So obviously every, every gig is like its own set of challenges, whether it's the material or, or something else. Um, but I've, Now that I've done it kind of like back to back enough times, I really do notice the differences. <laughs> so, uh, yes, on a technical challenge level, Death Clock is a really challenging gig. You know, like yeah. the, the difference between really locking in with Gene and, and Pete and, and really like being tight and just being slightly off where it sounds horrible is like right. such a fine line already. <laughs> However, you know, you're blessed with the, the kind of players where you can, they're the best foundation you could possibly have to right. ever have a chance of locking in with. Yeah. So, um, you know, I think that's part of the biggest things. And then because it's such a technically challenging bit of music yeah. to do that with. The drummer um, is Gene Hogland, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. So yeah, you're in good yeah. hands. <laughs> yeah, well, exactly, right? And so you still have to make sure you're... Right, drunk. yeah. 
Kind but of. but and and that's the thing it's like it's a relentless set like it's not very long it's just a little over an hour but mm -hmm. there's very few uh off moments there's there's like three videos i think where face bones comes in and, and does a little public service announcement <laughs> about about uh doing drugs or or bathing mm -hmm. or something um and it's like 60 seconds each time and <laughs> like that's the only time we have to like take a sip of water relax <laughs> but between each songs like Actually, in both gigs, you go really like right in, so you really got to be on it. Um, but with Danny, we just have the breaks with the orchestra. You know, it's right. like I feel like with that show, it's more I, I call it um, it's like high intensity interval training <laughs> <laughs> because like you play two songs and they're super super intense, and then you have a, a one orchestra piece break, but that break is like just as intense and shorter, and you really got to like. <laughs> Yeah, Danny especially, right? Catches his breath, and then you're back into like the two other challenge, and it's 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 like, and that breaks the flow too. So it's it's just like it's such a different thing. But at the end of the day, I think the similarities are like, you got to be on, you got to be on your feet, you're you got to be present all the time, because right. there's there's a lot of stuff to miss. <laughs> And right, yeah. yeah. And I would imagine if with Danny Elfman, it's more like laid out as an orchestra that you have to really play every single note in every single point or, or there's more like a space for improvisation. Uh, there's there's some space for improvisation. I mean, the, the good part is that, you know, we're we're the band and then you have the orchestra. So we're not in the orchestra. We're not reading. We're not. Oh, OK. You know, okay. So it's still we get together as a band and rehearse for weeks before we rehearse with the orchestra. So okay. we do adapt parts as a band and uh, rearrange, you know, old Boingo tunes that have been played a million different ways. And so trying to come up with parts together and like Danny's really great about asking for input, wanting input, having that freedom. So even if it's not completely improvisatory, like it's been worked out as a band by the time you, you get there. So like, I, I know kind of what, my parts are going to be, but it's something that was worked as a, it feels like a band. Yeah, you know? right, right, right. Okay, so now the difference from Cirque du Soleil, mm -hmm. I will <laughs> guess, probably Cirque du Soleil, I imagine is more like performative, like you yes, have to do something right. like, that's right. that. yes. look at me, look at me, look at right. me. Right, yeah. And you know, that's kind of why I like the variety because everything gives you like a slightly different thing and then the, the running theme is the maybe the level of production or the the size of the crazy aspect and each in a different way mm -hmm. but you're right yeah with Cirque it's very performative um in the beginning especially it was the challenge of how do you play this music well how do you play the beaded solo well with not just standing there and like playing it like that you know mm -hmm. and I mean you have to you don't have a you don't have a choice because that that stage is very dangerous there's there's holes in it in different times there's <laughs> crazy traffic there's people like flipping and jumping like you speaking of being on <laughs> right like you really have to know where you're walking because literally that theater is a death trap whether you're on stage or not and so and i've eaten shit more than once on stage off stage doesn't matter like you have to be so careful and i don't even need help i can trip over myself in sneakers <laughs> no problem so so i'm always like extra 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 careful did you went to the crazy audition because they, i know they have like some sort of super crazy audition sometimes i think yeah when they do like dance auditions and stuff they do like big groups of people and, and stuff like that i mean i think with with this role it's harder to cast so when i auditioned for it in person it was me and, an, and another girl that was auditioning but re it, it was really the the focus of the audition was walking backwards in boots playing the beaded solo like that's what you have to sell because that's that's the moment and then you're right. gonna have to shoot fire while you're doing it so you have to be comfortable um but uh it it teaches you to really like like you said you know it teaches you to to perform and give a little bit more and and because the schedule is so crazy okay. you practice it a lot it desensitizes <laughs> you you know you really you really do learn to perform and i and i i can tell the difference now going out and doing something else you know doing things that i probably <laughs> wouldn't right. have done before you know are just coming out just for fun <laughs> right 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 of course. So, so great. So uh, talk me about being a female artist. Uh, now you, I feel you are like a very well-established guitar yeah, player. Thank but you. Take me to 
back in the day when you were kind of starting, looking for a job, looking for a gig, you being a woman, you know, 20 years ago, the world wasn't the same. Yeah. And so you face any challenges, like any sort of problems, let's call it? You know, I, it's hard to know, right? Because it's not like, most people don't come and say something to your face like, hey, we're not going to hire you because you're a woman. Yeah, and and right, right, right. Times, you know what happened with, you know. Um, you're right. You know, things things were different back then. But I, I have always had a positive experience, you know. Like, I never felt like people weren't treating me with respect just because I was a woman playing guitar. Um, I don't know what's said behind <laughs> my back. You know what I mean? It's like you, you never know. But I think even back then, it, I, I always felt like it, it kind of evens out, right? Because it's like every opportunity that you get unfairly because you're a woman is another opportunity that you don't get unfairly because you're a woman. So okay. I think at the end of the day, it just feels like it averages out to something. Right. And and yeah, I mean, you know, there there was is a sense that you, you have to maybe – really prove yourself a little bit more than than somebody next to you maybe but again it's like i never had anything to compare it to and and now especially like you said i mean people don't i i, I think we have come a long way you know right. and so many great guitar players both men, men and women working and i think that's that's the real proof Right. Yeah. I mean, at the and at the end of the day, you have to rub yourself. You have to actually yeah. play. <laughs> so, exactly. Yeah. And so I think we are getting to the point where it doesn't matter, and people are <laughs> remembering that. Okay. Um. I never really thought about. You know, it's like it's so funny because when you grow up, you don't think like, oh, I'm a I'm a girl, and I happen to play guitar, and I guess that's different than you know, like to me, maybe it's because I grew up with brothers, but. I never found it strange that I didn't have a female guitarist role model to look up to or whatever. And I, because I didn't think about it in those terms, I, I wasn't okay. thinking like, Oh, I guess, I guess we're really not being represented. I, I was just kind of like, Oh yeah. So girls are not into this. Like I didn't think this was like a gender thing because it's music, but You're right. <laughs> you right. know, so to you, it's just like, Oh, huh. okay. <laughs> 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 Anyway, that's I mean, a perspective I've, I've yeah, had sure, on it. Yeah, sure, sure. So. Now, I'm telling you because uh, when I speak to male side, where, where they have a, like, um, I don't know, they didn't get the job, they didn't get the audition, mm. whatever, and a woman get the job, usually the excuse is, oh, it's just because it's a woman and it's beautiful and right. it's just, uh, whatever. And I don't think it's the case. Like, dude, she plays really well. And she yeah. plays, like... <laughs> they're like better than you <laughs> like literally there's, than you. there's so many reasons that people get gigs and a lot of times your ability to play is only one of the important reasons yeah, exactly. to get a gig right and so yeah like you have to have a certain level of let's say expertise and knowing what you're doing yeah. but there's a million but that only gets you the audition that doesn't get you the gig it's like right. that's the threshold hopefully Right? right. So, yeah, I, I've talked about this in previous podcasts, and it's always the same that there's a lot of people who get the job just because it's really nice. I mean, yeah. he and plays, you know, exactly. like he plays whatever he or she needs to play. To do. Exactly. But she or she is great. She's a great hang, and that's it. That and, that's and why shouldn't the job. it be like that? You know what I mean? Yeah, it's like exactly. if the person is doing is delivering. Yeah, that's it. That's all you can ever ask of anybody. <laughs> yeah, and you're gonna spend a lot of months together, so you that's better, <laughs> you it. better get along. Absolutely, people want to work with their friends for a reason, you know. Right. You're, yeah. You're, 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 you don't want to put yourself through hell. Life's too short for that, and we, mm. <laughs> we, we have enough sacrifices in the music business to sacrifice that too. Exactly. So. Okay. So, in your personal growth, there's a. Any point in history in your career where you say, this is a pivotal moment. This is mm. the thing that changed my career mm. for a Um, I guess the, the biggest one that I that just pops into my mind, uh, a really significant one, was when I first started playing with Tony McAlpine. And I was very young and, and straight out of college and had absolutely no experience and, and no confidence that I could hang with players like that. 
Um, and we had three weeks of rehearsal that I didn't really feel like I was necessarily going that, that hard or, you know, whatever. I didn't feel like I was doing that great either, but I came home after those three weeks and it changed things even in my technique that I wasn't like consciously even trying to change. And all of a sudden it, it felt like a growth spurt. And cause you were in that situation where you have to sink or swim and it didn't feel great at the time, but mm -hmm. all of a sudden, like I never knew that shifts could happen that quick in anything, you know, because right. it's usually not like that. Right. You usually don't notice progress and it seems slow and kind of going like that. Yeah, right, and, right. Um, but every once in a while, if you're blessed to have an experience that really immerses you in something, you, you, you mm -hmm. can still like come out having had a real kind of transformation. Right. So, and people who will kick your ass, technically exactly. speaking, like exactly. that way you get going to feel good. Yeah. You know, <laughs> you're going to feel like shit about yourself, but it, it was really like a, a really big one and a significant one. And I think when it happens at, a, at an age where, you know, I was 22, so it was a real kind of formative age in a lot of ways still, not just musically, but it's, it's, you're, you're in that right moment to be a sponge for that stuff. It's like right. ever since then, it's like, I notice moments like that, but they're not as pivotal and, and instrument. It's kind of like when you start playing guitar, right? Like the, the going from not playing anything to playing a bunch of chords is mm -hmm. the biggest leap you're going to have. Right. Right. So. Yeah, yeah. I totally understand. So uh, I want to tell you this because this is, uh, nobody knows this. So okay. you are the first one. And this is the name of this podcast is Devil on the Backstage, but right. I'm about to change it after oh. this, uh, this interview because, well, the name is going to be something along the lines of women in music or something. Oh, cool. And this is because I've been contacting, contacting a lot of people, men and women. Mm. And coincidentally, all the people who say yes and actually did it are women so far. <laughs> and the men, the men who say yes, the men who like, yeah, sure, bro, just give me, I give the calendar, I'll give like you. Yeah, yeah. And they never show up. They never oh, man. do nothing. And then I, uh, fo I follow up, like, wait, uh -huh. what's up? But you need more days, new time, whatever. And I'm ghosted like, like bad. Ah, come so on, guys. <laughs> Don't give yourselves a bad name. <laughs> but, <laughs> that give that give me the idea, like absolutely, uh -huh. and Victoria Bialik, uh, Becky Baldwin, and then you. Nice. That cool. makes sense. Like now, this podcast is officially thanks to you, <laughs> women in music. <laughs> cool. Well, I'm happy to help. <laughs> <laughs> so, and because of this, I have a new added question that I probably okay. will never ask if this wasn't the case. So, what advice you have for specifically women aspiring musicians? Uh, specifically probably mm -hmm. they that they want to get into rock metal instrumentalist instrumental music so i mean honestly it's the it's the same advice that i would give any musician you know like make sure you're doing it for the love of music and for the right reasons because it's you're not going to feel fulfilled if you don't because it's too, it's too tough of a business to like do it for any other reason i feel like um, and just like we talked about, be, be a good person, do, do your homework, show up prepared. Those are things that you don't think would set you apart, but they actually do, you know, and that's for anybody, you know, if you're, if you're the person who shows up, that, that means something to people. And at the end of the day, when you're working with other bands, it's, it's a relationship and it's a, hopefully it's going to be a, a family. And if you give your band leader and your bandmates the sense that you got their back that's the biggest gift that i think you can have you know and 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 i don't know that's that's at least how i try to stay employed no, <laughs> no, no that's totally true and that's really powerful neely thank you yeah. very much for being here with me thank you for having me yeah sure where can we find you so uh, i mean i'm on the socials right instagram facebook uh is at neely brush on instagram and then neely brush music on facebook neely brush.com has all the info always the added dates uh, updated dates um yeah. yeah yeah i'm gonna make sure to link all this stuff in the description 
So Perfect. you guys, please follow Neely. Follow her work. It's really intense and it's Thank really you, good. And Appreciate it. Neely, I was hoping you to see you this October, <laughs> but probably not going to happen. But oh. I'm, I'm sure I'm going to see you somewhere along the future. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> It's been too long since I've been to Mexico, so... Yep, now it's time. Yes. <laughs> well, thank you very much and see you soon.